All right. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Sam Ritholtz. Uh, I'm I'm a DPhil student in the Department of International Development here at Oxford and one of the conveners this term for Oxford's Queer Studies Network. Uh, we are so delighted and honored to welcome the award-winning activist and author Sarah Schulman for our live online event. From her 1990s novel, Rap Bohemia and Peep Novels, Rap Bohemia and People in Trouble, to more recent works of groundbreaking nonfiction like The Gentrification of the Mind and Conflict is Not Abuse, Schulman has long been a leading voice in queer, queer literature and politics. A novelist, playwright, screenwriter, nonfiction writer, and AIDS historian, we're here today to discuss her 20th book, Let the Record Show, a political history of ACT UP New York, 1987 to 1993, which has been described by the New York Times as a masterpiece tome, part sociology, part oral history, part memoir, part call to arms. The book challenges familiar narratives about AIDS activism as a victory attained by individuals and instead shows how a broad coalition with constantly changing leadership won significant victories for people with AIDS in documenting the vital work of a broad range of white men working with and next to women and people of color. Shulman provides an urgent intervention and a timely reconceptualizing of this moment in queer history, one that creates space for us to reflect upon the ongoing fight against the epidemic. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. We're, we're so thrilled yeah. to have you. Thank you. I'm here in New York where things are getting back to normal. Uh, that's, that's, that's a beautiful word, normal. Yes. <laughs> may, may no, no, zero COVID deaths. Yeah. May, may we all feel that and feel that word sometime soon. We're, we're about a, allegedly a month and four days away from a reopening of England. So fingers crossed. Um, so before we dive in, just some logistics. Uh, Sarah and I will be speaking, and after about 25, 30 minutes of us speaking, we'll we'll start. Uh, we'll take audience questions. Uh, the way audience questions will work is the very bottom of the Zoom function. There's a Q and A button. Um, so please feel free to type in any questions. Please feel free to type them in as the conversation's going. So don't wait till the end. Um, please just. Every time if something interesting comes up, just write a little question in and then we'll, at the end, we'll have one of my colleagues, Madeline, will come up and, and help facilitate the question and answer. Um, and so just to, to start off, this is an extraordinary work. Um, it's a work of, I found it just of staggering grace and reflection. I actually, I listened to it on audiobook and the narrator, um, Rosalind Coleman Williams, does such a fabulous job and makes the emotional subject even more evocative because She's at certain points, you can tell that she's, her voice is cracking and she's tearing up. Um, and so it's, it's really, it's, it's a magnificent text. And I just wanna say thank you so much for writing it. Um, I, I feel really privileged uh, just have the opportunity to, to speak with you here today um, and to discuss it. And so I wanna dive into it, but my, my academic inklings are pushing me to think about actually the process of writing it. I mean, this is a text um, that is 700 pages. As we were just saying, it's 2.5 pounds. Um, and it's also your 20th book. And so I was just wondering, 20 books later, the work comes out, why now? Well, there's a long answer to that. So, <laughs> um, so you know, in 1979, I was part of the grassroots gay and lesbian and feminist press, which was kind of an underground press uh, where journalists worked for free. And it's because our our news was not covered by the mainstream press. And I was like a girl reporter out on the go. And 1981 is when AIDS was first noticed by science. Although we now think that it was in New York in the 1960s. So I started covering AIDS at that point. Um, in the first five years of the epidemic, when 40,000 people died in the United States, I covered uh, issues of pediatric AIDS, which were very big in New York City at the time. A lot of people were born HIV positive. And I covered it through a social justice lens. And also community issues. I covered the when the health department closed the bathhouses and the first PWA arrest. Uh, and then ACT UP was founded in 87. And I joined in July. It was founded in March. ACT UP had a split in 92 where 12 people left to form treatment action group and hundreds of people remained, but the split was devastating to the morale of the organization. And in 93, the, the medications had really hit a wall and a lot of people died. 
By 96 was the protease inhibitors, one of the good drugs that came out and started. And 99 is the internet revolution in which left ACT UP in the cold because none of our material was digitized. So if you searched ACT UP in like 2000, you would find nothing. So in 2001, Jim Hubbard, which is technically the 20th anniversary of AIDS, but it's really the 20th anniversary of noticing AIDS. My collaborator, filmmaker Jim Hubbard and I started the ACT UP Oral History Project, which people can find at um, actuporalhistory.org. And for the next 18 years, I interviewed 188 people, surviving members of ACT UP New York. And we put up the transcripts for free on our, on our website where they still are. And we've had 14 million hits since that time. But we thought that one of you guys, some academic would come along and analyze these transcripts, but that never happened. Jim made a feature film, United in Anger, A History of ACT UP, that some of you saw this week. It's available for free on YouTube and Canopy. And Jim and I took that film all over the world. We literally took it to Russia right after the anti-gay laws, to India, Brazil, Palestine, Lebanon. And then this kind of false history started to emerge of um, every time you saw ACT UP mentioned, it was, you know, founded by Larry Kramer and the leader was Larry Kramer. And then this uh, other work came out saying like these five guys, these five uh, treatment activists were the ones, they did everything and they changed everything. And all of a sudden we were like, oh, it's state of emergency, bad history is being told. And not, not only is it a problem because it's wrong, but it's giving contemporary activists the, the opposite of the information that they need, which is actually that change is made by collectivity and by community and by coalition and not by John Wayne and the heroic white male individual. So it was kind of a state of emergency and we desperately looked for somebody who would write a book with all the materials and we couldn't find anybody. And then we decided I had to do it because it was, it was all gonna disappear and be replaced by this fake story. So I, did it, but I really didn't want to. I'm a novelist and it's not my kind of thing. But I spent three years rereading the interviews I had conducted. So when I started writing the book, the first thing I realized was that it couldn't, the history could not be chronological because it wouldn't be accurate because so much was happening at the same time. And that, that, that simultaneity of response was really part of the power that achieved the paradigm shift. So that needed to be represented. Now, fortunately, I had a lot of experience with formal invention. I mean, I've written a lot of novels. Some of them are like realist novels, but some of them are formally inventive. And I have a lot of experience with experimental film. So I had the formal skills to try to find a form that would actually convey the content. Because often traditional narrative form actually represses content. Uh, and sometimes with certain kinds of content, you know, content should dictate form. And so I started to cohere tropes and themes and kind of elevate the material so that you could read a book that would actually convey somewhat what, how ACT UP really functioned. So that's why now, you know, it's not for any other reason than the story I just told you, well, basically that nobody else came along. Yeah, and that actually was my second question as well, as I was so curious about how you decided to structure the piece, because it's written, I mean, it's a lot of these testimonies, it's written by subjects, it's not, um, it's not necessarily, as you said, in, um, in, a, in a certain chronological time order. Um, and so I, I guess in, in, de in developing it, were there certain, I guess, I guess, were there certain aspects of, of the experience or, or the takeaways that you wanted readers to get that impacted how you structured it? Um, obviously, well, the focus is not nostalgia. The focus is to try to cohere the strategies and tactics of the organization in a way that can be helpful to activists today. And there was no record. I mean, ACT UP never theorized itself. So there was not even like a coherent timeline. There was not any kind of how the organization was structured. There was no map of that. When Jim and I started interviewing, we had both been in ACT UP. And, you know, everyone that we got to had the same 
flaws of vision that we had, which is that everyone in ACT UP thought that what they and their friends did was ACT UP. And no one had an organizational overview. So as we started interviewing people, we started to understand how big the picture was. And it was very important that the radical democracy of the organization that allowed people to respond from where they were at and produced an incredible range of reach in different milieu and different modes at the same time, because ACT UP was not a consensus-based movement. So you didn't have to agree with everything. Um, it did have a statement of unity, direct action to end the AIDS crisis. That was it. That was the principle of unity. So it's direct action as opposed to social service provision. And if you were doing something that was direct action to end the AIDS crisis, basically you could do it. But like, let's say you wanted to do something that I thought was terrible. Well, I would argue with you because it was very much pre-gentrification New York culture. So very confrontational and on the tape, uh, you know, people put their feelings out there. But in the end, I would never stop you from doing it. If I didn't agree with you, I just wouldn't do it. I would go get people who I agreed with to do something that we wanted to do. And this, you know, this Big Ten politics uh, structure is what enabled ACT UP to have so much influence. Yeah, there's, there's a, a refrain that is mentioned multiple times in the book in relation to this, which is when focused on action instead of theory, theory will emerge. And I yes, so, so it was a constituency movement for people with AIDS. And by the time ACT UP came into being in 1987, it would have been six years since AIDS was first noticed by science. And there were no treatments. 40,000 people had died. I mean, it was a disaster. And so the needs of people with AIDS determined the agenda of the movement and their needs were immediate change. So the demands had to be very real world oriented and the organization needed to be extremely effective. And it turns out that if you wanna be effective and you wanna actually accomplish things, you have to work, focus on action, not theory. So the, you know, there is a, a left model of a kind of Gramscian praxis that you develop your theory and then you apply your theory to practice. But that actually produces a lot of empty debate and polarization and win time that doesn't do anything for anybody. But one of the leaders of ACT UP, Maxine Wolf, would often say that action, if you do action, your theory will emerge because you decide your action and then you have to make it happen. And in order to do that, you have to make decisions. You have to make a lot of decisions. And making those decisions coheres your values. And that's where you get your theory. Right. <laughs> So the, the legacy of ACT UP in terms of how we conceive of social movements and activism in America today and globally, obviously, is, is, it's, very, it's very palpable. But I, I am curious about at the time, were there certain social movements or, or uh, approaches that inspired ACT UP? I mean, this is very, it seems like a very advanced conception of radical democracy, as you stated. And so did it come from somewhere or was it just quite natural? Comes in very interesting and weird ways. So the first, if you look at the history of the the autonomous gay movement, the reason that there was first a gay movement, then a gay and lesbian movement, then a gay lesbian bisexual, then a gay lesbian bisexual and trans movement that was autonomous is because the rest of the left did not want us. So prior to the movement being conformed, there's a history of queer people being kicked out of the left. So the Communist Party, for example, expelled gay people. Famously, Bayard Rustin was sidelined in the Black Civil Rights Movement uh, because he was gay. The feminist movement has a, has a history that has not been fully documented of lesbian purges um, in the reproductive rights movement and in the earlier women's rights movement. So we were forced into an autonomous gay movement for those reasons. And because of that, people think that that's, they look at it as a discrete movement that comes from nowhere or that only comes from other gay places. But actually 
certain kinds of people in ACT UP came from, had been previously politically active, and it was mostly women and people of color. And that's very interesting because ACT UP was a primarily white male, gay male organization, but it was not an exclusively gay male organization. And most of the men, the older men, like Vito Russo and uh, other well-known people came from gay liberation, but the younger men had not been politically active and had no political experience. Many of the women came from reproductive rights movement, the feminist women's health movement and the women's peace movement. There were people who came from the Latin American student movement against fascism, because this was the era of dictatorships in Chile and Argentina and from the Mexico City student movement. There were people who had been in the Black Liberation Movement, who had worked with the Black Panthers, who had been in CORE, the Civil Rights Movement. And these people brought very concrete strategies. And I even name them in the book, who the people were and what strategies they brought to ACT UP. So for example, Jamie Bauer had been in the Women's Peace Movement and they brought um, civil disobedience training, which was a centerpiece of ACT UP culture. People like Marion Bonsoff, who had been in the feminist women's health movement, brought the idea of patient-centered politics. And whenever you interview anyone from ACT UP, they always say people with AIDS are the experts. Like that's a very common belief. Um, and these ideas were brought through educationals, through teach-ins, because one of the things in ACT UP is that there were no spokespeople. Any person in ACT UP could be a spokesperson. So as a result, the rank and file was very informed and they're con constantly were teachings and people had a very sophisticated understanding of the social and science issues around HIV AIDS. So, um, so that was one way that there was influence of previous movements. Another way is that generationally, most people in ACT UP were born in the 40s, 50s and 60s. I was born in 1958. So when we were queer kids, which was not a concept that existed at the time, right? There was an, the idea of being a queer child is a new concept, but we, nonetheless, we were. And so we had no idea that there would ever be a gay community or gay politics or anything like that. But we did see black resistance on television and that was primetime news. It was in Life Magazine, it was in Jet Magazine, a few people's families participated. So as a child, we saw, as children, we saw Black people standing up to the police, Black people doing nonviolent civil disobedience, Black people doing creative direct action, like sitting in a, at segregated lunch counters, for example. And this had enormous influence on ACT UP, even though it was never discussed. Because when I was researching the book, I went back and reread Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, where he lays out his definition of direct action. And it is exactly, the, the way ACT UP thought of direct action. Even though we never said, hey, this is what Martin Luther King did. Let's all read this article. Never, never was it. Because ACT UP never theorized itself because it was so busy. So that's a huge influence. And then the third realm is that if you look at footage of the Monday night meetings, which are usually three to 700 people, you can see that it's, it's primarily white gay men. That's primarily who's there. But people from ACT UP left those meetings and went to work on their various campaigns in coalition with lots of different communities and organizations. So you have people leaving that meeting and going to work on needle exchange uh, with drug users and with harm reduction people or going to work with women with HIV to get the definition of AIDS changed so women could qualify for experimental drug trials or working with the homeless, ACT UP started Housing Works, the Organization for Homeless People with AIDS, or working with incarcerated people, or doing all kinds oh, of work. Patients, you know, on so many levels that were not in the room on Monday night, but were auxiliary arenas in which ACT UP was active. And so there you also have reciprocal relationships with other movements. Great. So, yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the other refrains that comes up a lot, and again, I don't, ACT, ACT UP didn't theorize itself, but it came up with a lot of good one-liners. Um, and one of them that comes to the conclusion of the book is this idea of AIDS prepared us for everything. Um, and I, I think- Jack Waters that, said that, yeah. Yeah, and I, that's really powerful. And you're talking about it in a personal capacity, but it obviously 
transcends the political, which I think everything about this, this, this history that you write shows. And so I was wondering, um, I guess it's been, this is, this is 30, 30 years since um, AIDS was first identified um, or HIV was first identified. 40, 40. 40 sorry, math. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what do you think is still left unlearned? Well, I mean, the, the worst lesson, and we're seeing it with COVID right now, is that AIDS activism broadly defined, you know, science, social services, activists, et cetera, was ultimately and quite quickly able to overcome HIV, but they couldn't defeat capitalism. So the, the good drugs came in in 1996, but there's still people dying of AIDS all over the world. And it's because of the lack of access and lack of economic uh, equality and, and because of racism. And we're seeing this with COVID now, you know, now that we got rid of Trump and we have someone who's semi-functional in the White House, you know, we have vaccine hoarding going on in the United States and trying to get, you know, a, he, they're just starting with the G7 to talk about getting vaccines out to poor countries. But Capitalism is still the the um, obstacle. Yeah, and really remarkable in, in the book is is this tension you draw out about whether the the movement should be advocating for well, well the, the difference between advocating for drugs and bodies as well as for universal health care and how close that came. And also throughout the book, which is uh, as an American is an impossible thing to avoid, is the presence of Tony Fauci. Um, and, and the parallels today between just in terms of this unknowable virus, the presence of the NIH, and, and just how different the narrative seems to be publicly about not only Tony Fauci, but the role of the US government in this. Well, you know, the, the main difference I think is very significant, which is that COVID is a collective public experience and it's discussed in public every day and it's in the media every day. And AIDS was our private nightmare. Uh, you know, as Vito Russo famously said, it's like being in a war and nobody else knows that it's happening. Mm -hmm. And our fight was to get it into the public. And that was just so hard. Um, and that's very different. What's similar is that every time there's a cataclysm, it reveals the inequalities of the society and it, it reveals economic inequality and, and it reveals racism and COVID is the same. Regarding Fauci, um, I, submitted my manuscript before COVID. So I wasn't really thinking about Fauci, mm. but it just turned out that a number of people working in different realms in ACT UP did tell me little things about him that I included in the book without really thinking about it. But the pattern is that whenever people went to Fauci with an innovation, he would say no. And the three examples were Jim Igo, who basically designed the parallel track six system that allowed drugs that were not approved to still be released for people who needed them. He had sent this design to Fauci in a letter that Fauci never answered. And three months later, Jim had to go to a place where Fauci was speaking in public and confront him. And, and you know, ACTUP would design our own solutions. And this is a very important lesson for activists today. Uh, ACTUP was not in an infantilized relationship to power where you're just begging the government to fix it. So ACTUP would design the solution. They would become the expert on the issue, uh, figure out the bureaucracy, figure out the policy issues, figure out the science issues, and present solutions. And Fauci said no. And Linda Meredith, who worked on the campaign to change the definition of AIDS so women could get benefits and, and treatment, she had the same problem with Fauci. It took two years to get a meeting with him. And then when they got there, he really was not interested. And then Richard Elovich, who was an advocate for um, former and active IV drug users, uh, went to Fauci and said, how come you're not enrolling IV drug users in trials? And Fauci was like, they're not reliable. And Richard was like, you cannot write off an entire class of people and condemn them to die of AIDS. So, you know, Fauci had to be forced to change his mind. He did change his mind, but um, you know, people had to break into his office and surround his building and do all kinds of things like that for a long, long time before he changed. Unfortunately, the media is now positioning him as the new John Wayne. You know, he's the new white male uh, heroic individual, but that's not really who he was. Yeah, and the the some of the most 
intense sections of the book involving him, but also just parts of the narrative that I think I uh, it was very confronting to read was about the, the women's movement within, in, within ACT UP. I mean, that was to get the definition to include women and to get um, symptoms or, or, or I guess, uh, uh, opportunistic infections or different types of things associated with, with female bodies to be recognized because they were so avoided by, um, by I guess, the male-centered focus of, of medicine at the time and currently as you, as you dictate in the end. And, uh, well, there were, there were a number of issues there. In the 1960s, there was a drug called thalidomide that was given to pregnant women, and many of them had children born without limbs. And pharma had to pay out a lot of money in settlements. So they were like, okay, no more women in experimental drug trials. So women with AIDS could not get experimental drugs. And women had different, uh, women had uh, symptoms like pelvic inflammatory disease that was very, very, very severe or cervical cancer that kept reoccurring. And a, a lesbian nurse who was an ACT UP named Risa Denenberg was working in the Bronx in a hospital and seeing hundreds of women with HIV. And she observed that these symptoms were prevalent. And, um, you know, when, when ACT UP started organizing women with HIV to try to get the government to change their definition, it's very interesting to, to see the trajectory there because it took four years to get this definition expanded. And during that time, many of the women with HIV who were in leadership of that campaign died. Mm. And in fact, one of the key leaders, Katrina Haslip, who was a formerly incarcerated woman, black woman and a Muslim, and a straight woman, who's one of the main leaders of that movement, she died because she couldn't qualify for benefits and she couldn't get home care. And she kept falling at home and she died a few weeks before the settlement. In fact, almost every woman with AIDS is dead from ACT UP. Um, and, you know, because women were tended to be poor, women of color, and tended to get diagnosed at a much later stage of the disease and then didn't have access to cutting edge treatments. So that it was a really significant difference. And that there's that in the book you talk about the phrase and, and the signs with the protests of dead but not disabled. Of, of well, our poster said um, women don't get AIDS; they just die of it. Right, yeah. that one as well, which is again, it's it's just extraordinarily striking. And and what I think was really interesting about when you're talking about this and talking about these public na almost public narratives about what what ACT UP was and what the AIDS crisis was. Um, you talk about this idea that those who were, I guess, um, engaging with power or, or just are being able to be accepted into the room with power, to talk with power, were the white gay men who either had the resources, had uh, the power. Let me finesse that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, fix that for me. But, <laughs> okay, but, so uh, I mean, like yeah. today, white gay man is a privilege category, but in 1981, they, it was not. Um, gay people were, were a very oppressed minority, and even in New York City. So just so you understand the context, gay sex was illegal. The sodomy law had been upheld right before ACT UP was founded by the Supreme Court. And in fact, gay sex was not nationally legalized in the United States until 2003. New York City had no gay rights bill. So you could be fired from any job, you could be kicked out of any apartment, you could be denied public accommodation, you could be denied service in a restaurant or in a hotel. Familial homophobia was the norm. It was virulent and had a huge, it was a huge force of history. It's been very under, as under un, mis, you know, it hasn't been seen as the impact for the impact that it had. And street violence against people who looked gay there was like a sport, an entertaining sport called gay bashing, where straight people would come into gay neighborhoods and beat up people who looked gay. And of course, there was no police or anything like that. So that was the that was the cultural environment. Now there were some very elite white men in ACT UP, not the majority, but there were some uh, people who worked at J.P. Morgan, who had gone to Harvard, who had gone to Yale, who were very presentable and had connections and were also very smart. But I want to emphasize that these people were, were rebels within their own class. I mean, 
Yes, one of our famous leaders, Peter Staley, had been a stockbroker at J.P. Morgan and comes from a very wealthy family. But he's the only stockbroker from J.P. Morgan who ever joined ACT UP. You know, even Larry Kramer, who was wealthy and connected and all of that, he used his power to yell at people he had access to on behalf of people with AIDS. And most gay men who had access and power did not do anything. So you had an elite and all the baggage that comes with that, but they were also exceptions. However, they were much more palatable to the powers that be. And at the time in the eighties, you know, the entire media was white and male. The entire private sector was white and male and the, the government was white and male. And the gay men who were in that power apparatus were in the closet for the most part. So for the rest of us, you know, white lesbian that I am, there was no one who even looked like me in the power structure. And so when, for example, Larry Kramer went to Yale with the head of a pharmaceutical company and he was able to call him and get a meeting and there's stories of the elite guys going to meetings with pharma and they would have like a catered lunch, you know, in the corporate headquarters and blah, blah, blah. Well, when the women started to organize and you know some of the key figures, it was either HIV positive women who tended to be poor and women of color, although some were white and they tended to be straight, although some were lesbian and white lesbians from ACT UP, including a poverty lawyer named Terry McGovern who was only 29 years old, who was suing the government at the time. They couldn't get a meeting for two years with the government. Because there was none of that sort of camaraderie or I see you, you see me kind of thing. And then if you compare that with the campaign to make needle exchange legal, because ACT UP did make needle exchange legal in New York City, that campaign was even messier. You know, two people in ACT UP OD'd and died. One guy stole $10,000. Um, ACT UP people illegally handed out clean needles and were arrested and had a test case and made needle exchange legal. But, you know, it really shows you that you have to pick your playbook based on your social position. And even within ACT UP, different sectors, some people could do respectability politics, but other people that was not an option. And you had to play dirty and you had to scream at people and handcuff yourselves to them and break into their offices and do all kinds of messy stuff. But the end message is that whoever you are, you can win but you have to fight harder and you have to be smarter and it takes longer and it has to be messy. Yeah, no, that's, thank you <laughs> for the course correction and for really detailing that because that's the essence of what, what I wanted um, to, I guess, discuss a bit more. And I, I guess what's interesting is in, in identifying those, those dynamics and even, dare I say, those logics, um, then there was something about the historicization of the movement that a lot of this got kind of put to the sideline. And, and this book stands in counter to that. But I am curious about, are there other more recent works of art, film, literature of that nature that perhaps you admire or does a better job of really recognizing the diversity that was behind this coalition? Well, I think that all along, uh, AIDS literature has been incredible mm -hmm. from the beginning. Um, and I'm part of that generation of people who sort of started AIDS literature. Um, but if you look at books like Kool-Aids, The Art of War by Rabi Amadeen, who is a HIV positive gay Lebanese writer who lives in San Francisco. It's an incredible book. It came out a very long time ago, but it positions AIDS against the backdrop drop of the Lebanese civil war. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. And there's many, many, many um, novels about AIDS that really do the job. But what happened with AIDS literature is it never got seen as American literature. You know, it always remained in this marginalized category because of the stigma. Uh, but that's where the best work is, I think. Sounds like we'll need to do a book club, <laughs> little QSN uh, book club. And so my final question for you, and then we'll open up to question and answer, is, is about this idea going back to, I guess, the, the, the recognition of difference within ACT UP and how important it was that this was a big tent, broad coalition, and um, that nowadays we'd say intersectional. I, I know that verbiage necessarily wasn't in, in the ACT UP manifestos at the time, 
But I think what's really striking about it is how much in the book you go through this idea of building these broad coalitions, but also recognizing difference. And, and as we were talking about before with the women's movement within AIDS, that there was this, there was this impact that was biomedical or biophysical about the, how male-centered research and science was at the time and how poorly it took into the account this idea of how, how is AIDS or how are, as you talk about in the conclusion, how any health issues are different for, for female-bodied people. And so what I want to ask you about and to kind of bring it to a modern day is that with all of this work that you've done to really conceptualize and, and argue quite forcefully in this text about recognizing this difference, um, you're also very well known in America for being a trans ally, for being very publicly um, pro-trans and pro the belief that women is a quote unquote trans inclusive category. And so I make this connection, I kind of set up this dichotomy because as, as you know, in, in this country, those, those, those logics are used as sort, of up, um, as sort of intellectual justification for gender critical or trans exclusionary feminism. And this idea that recognizing women as a trans inclusive category erases the category of women is a very common frame. Um, and so I was wondering as someone who really had to grapple with this for years as both in your activist and, and now you're talking about in your personal life, how do you reconcile those, that, that false dichotomy I set up? And how do you, I guess, recognize women as a gender, as a trans inclusive category, and then also the recognition of the importance of difference? I mean, we sit here and look at what's going on in England like this. Like it's, it's so mean. I, I, it's hard to even understand. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of anti-trans stuff, but it's all from the, you know, the, the, the pro-Trump right. Um, and of course these alliances are, you know, the, the, the feminist right-wing alliance, that did happen during the pornography wars. So this isn't the first time that that's happened. But um, the Lesbian Avengers, which was a group that I co-founded in 1992, and that had a very wonderful chapter in London that I believe sailed across into parliament on ropes and pulleys to protest section 28, I think it was called. Anyway, the Lesbian Avengers was trans inclusive from the beginning in 1992. We voted 99 to one to include trans women. So this, this kind of obsession uh, and, um, supremacy ideology that is persecuting people today is recent. I don't, you know, it's, uh, it can't, I, don't, I don't even really understand it, to be honest. And I'm old gay, so I come from the old gay world where there was, you know, everybody. Uh, and it's the political categories that, um, I stopped going to the Michigan Festival when they excluded uh, trans women, trans people, and Lesbian Avengers was part of creating Camp Trans a million years ago. So it's just, it's just supremacy ideology as far as I understand it. Yeah, no, I, that was very powerful. So thank you. Um, so I want to pause now and invite to on stage <laughs> to the to our Zoom panel, uh, Madeline. Madeline, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and then you can join straight into the into the Q&A. Hi, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I'm Madeline Sadenberg. I'm another one of the um, co-conveners of this year's QSN as we move into um, next year. And um, I'm in the English department here doing a DPhil. Um, and I've been so inspired by this, by this conversation, by both of you, the questions and the answers. And also I've been getting to read all the questions as they come in from our audience, which have been so rich and interesting. I know, um, the book here, uh, somebody asked right at the beginning how they can get the book here. And I know that it's available via Blackwell. It's just been published this week here. You might have to order it. You I think because the, it. <laughs> the, it weighs so much that I think that the stores in, in Britain have been afraid to order enough copies and they get sold really quickly. That's what I've been hearing. Yeah. I will say it is possible. So, uh, okay. absolutely. Um, so I'm just gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm, was so excited by um, what you spoke about at the beginning in terms of the, the formal shifts that you're sort of using when creating this story and this archive. And not just chronologically, but, but sort of thinking about this book as a, as a handbook for activists now, and also as, a, as an archive um, that, that centers oral history. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about 
the the methodology that you were using when you were speaking to people and as you were putting this together um okay sure so i'm not trained you know um i only have a ba and jim hubbard also is not an academic so we just started looking at oral history archives when we before we started our own to try to figure out how to do it and we looked at two holocaust archives so the first one we looked at was the Steven Spielberg Shoah project, which is this enormous project. It had, I think, 1,500 people asking questions. Uh, the questions were the same. Everybody was asked the same question. And it was designed to respond to Holocaust revisionism, which was a phenomena uh, at that period where third parties claimed that the Holocaust never happened even though the people who did the Holocaust said that it did happen. So it was this like very weird delusional ideology that was emerging. And so the questions for the show project focus on the trauma and the moment of atrocity. And we just didn't think that that served our needs because we wanted to individuate people. Uh, but we did see a smaller archive run by the Fortunoff department store family that was in at Yale where they asked people who they were before the Holocaust. And that one really appealed to us. Also, one of the questions that we started with was what do these people have in common? Because it's a small group of people act up. Uh, the meetings topped out at about 700. The largest demonstration was Stop the Church in December, 1989, when act up disrupted mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And that was only 7,000 people. So it was never a mass movement. It was always a vanguard movement. So we're very interested in who these people were, who were so effective. And we would, so when we first started interviewing in 2001, video was still on a cassette. So we, the cassettes were 40 minutes. So we used the first tape to talk about their lives before they joined ACT UP. And, you know, if you analyze those early interviews, the first three years, I'm always going like, so did your family go to church? Did they belong to the PTA? Like I'm trying to find, were you a brownie? You know, I'm trying to find like, what was the community link? And I couldn't find anything. There was no consistent commonality in terms of early childhood prep towards um, community. So then we switched to maybe everyone had some kind of foundational experience with AIDS, but that did not pan out either. There were people in ACT UP who did not know anyone with AIDS. Uh, they, they would like there was a woman who was sitting in Newark and she was so act up on TV and the next day she took the Jersey Transit to the village and went to the gay center and joined act up. You know, it's like or some a straight woman who came in because her, you know, she thought she could people looked nice and she could make friends there and she ended up this is Karen Timor. She ended up at one point someone said is there anyone here who could work on insurance and she's like I could try. And uh, for five years she masterminded the campaign to uh, remove HIV as a pre-existing condition that would keep people from getting health care and made insurance, private insurance available to 500,000 people. You know, so like these amazing people. Anyway, so experience with AIDS was not the common ground. And then um, eight years into the project, I interviewed this woman named Rebecca Cole, who had come to New York to be an actress. She was working in a bar. And somebody came in and said, oh, they're hiring people at the AIDS hotline. It pays $10 an hour or something. So she took the job. And the AIDS hotline was this random thing because there was no information. Nobody even knew how AIDS was communicated. There were no treatments. It was these actors working for $10 an hour. People would call and say, like, if someone has AIDS and they serve me a hamburger, can I get AIDS? I mean, it was just, and they didn't know. Anyway, um, a woman called her from Connecticut and said, I have AIDS and I can't get into an experimental drug trial. And they're saying it's because I'm a woman. And Rebecca was like, that can't be. So she started calling all these experimental drug trials and she found out that they all excluded women. And she thought, well, that, that's horrible. So she called the CDC. She called the government and made an appointment. And with a friend went and had a meeting with them and said, hey, women are being excluded. And this was the beginning of the solidarity movement with women with HIV. And then I was like, aha, Eureka, I see what these people have in common. It's not experiential, it's characterological. This is a type of person who cannot be a bystander. You know, and it took a long time to pull that together. So you know, in terms of asking questions, um, 
each person is asked different questions. We were constantly expanding our knowledge base and we were always looking for new things. I did all but two of the interviews and no one ever refused to answer a question. Even people who I disagree with and even people I don't like, but we don't like each other because there's a bond between people who were in ACT UP because we had a very unique experience, not just the death, the mass death, but we were able to succeed on some level. And very few people in movements have that success experience. So there's a bonding and people wanted to make record about what they did. So that was it. And then, you know, we just posted everything. Um, when it came time to analyzing the material, I had never thought that that was gonna be me. Uh, but I started to notice things right away. Like when I started rereading the interviews years later, people would say like, yeah, I was hanging out at the gay center and I saw those people in, the, in the, that other room and it was an ACT UP meeting. Or yeah, I was going to the gay center for my health care and ACT UP was meeting. And I realized like, oh, you know, if you meet in a space that your community already identifies with, that they already trust and they already go to, the transcripts reveal that that helps you attract the community. And so that was like a theorizing of ACT UP that I did but you know, not intentionally, it just by analyzing the transcripts and many things were like that. I think a lot of the students on this call right now will empathize with their, with their professors telling them that to get your theory, go through your empirics. I, I think that's running through a lot of our heads. S Sarah, I'm just wondering now and in, in hearing this, what about, and you talk about it in the book, you talk about your own reason, what pulls you into the movement um, in terms of your, your previous journalism, but I guess like, was it char character logical with you or what sustained you that, and you know, 40 years later, you're now, you're coming, you're still coming out with books on the subject matter and you're, you have a documentary and you have all this experience. I mean, is there, an, was there an experience or a character trait that really keeps you maintained as a leader in this space? Well, I think a lot of it is the burden of history and living, you know, so I was in the first group of AIDS journalists by accident. because I was already going to City Hall for other reasons. And then so many people died. I mean, there's very few people alive who have been documenting this thing from the beginning. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. You know, so that's one part of it. It's also fascinating. I mean, it's incredibly interesting. Um, and also, you know, I was born in 1958. So I was born 13 years after the end of the Holocaust. So I'm really like this post-Holocaust person. And my family was heavily impacted. My, my, mother had, my mother's mother had two brothers and two sisters who were exterminated in the Holocaust. My mother's father, sister was murdered. I mean, it's very close, you know, it's my grandparents' generation, my mother's aunts and uncles. And so I'm from that generation of children where nothing was kept from us. And um, I knew about the Holocaust since I was born. And I have, you know, was heavily emphasized in my family that other people stood by and did nothing and allowed this to occur. So the bystander issue was very present in my life from the beginning, you know, and then I'm sure there's some kind of, probably some character, whatever, what, what is character anyway, that I don't go into, you know, is that nature or nurture? I don't know. There's so much in here about, about the, the stories that you carry throughout your life and how they change you and also how they change. And we've got two questions here that I'm just curious to see what you think of. Uh, two different people, Jack and um, Anna have asked about whether there have been any AIDS narratives in, in art or in sort of archive and journalism that in, in recent years that you feel like have done it right. Jack asks, you know, in the book, you argue that many of the big mainstream works about AIDS in the 90s, like Philadelphia and Angels in America, really center straight experience and depoliticize or misrepresent the unfolding of the epide epidemic. And um, whether that, that representational landscape has has changed at all, um, obviously. Yeah. Changing it. Well, I want to first say that I think the reason those works are mainstream is because they do that. And that that was the requirement, that if they had actually been accusatory towards the people who were actually causing the death, the mass death, they wouldn't have been mainstream. They wouldn't have been rewarded. I wrote a book called Stage Struck, Theater AIDS and the Marketing of Gay America, in which I 
it's it's an analysis of the phenomena of rent, and we don't have to go into that because it's its own story. But the you know the play, the move, the musical rent. But I look at other works that came out the same year that talk about the people who are misrepresented in rent accurately and how those works were incredibly marginalized. But I, I list, I think, five or seven of them and I go into them in detail. So that work is available. But in terms of journalism, you know, part of the reason that people think AIDS is over is because it's a problem that came from within. And there's a moment in the book, I just want to go into this because I think it's intense. There's, so, there, so being an act up meant that people were dying all the time and AIDS is a terrible death, just so people realize that. It, your immune system starts stops working and very young people would get these opportunistic infections like dementia and blindness and would be starving because their bodies couldn't process nutrition. And these would be your friends. You know, it was really intense. Um, so, um, see now I'm upset and I forgot what I was gonna say. Cause I was just talking about the, the intense experience of the thing. So what were we just talking about? Oh yeah, other works. Okay, so there's, a, so there's a lot of stories in the book about people's dying because that's what was happening all the time. So there's a guy named Mark Simpson who died, who realized he was not gonna make it and he decided he was gonna take his own life. And his friend, Tom Kalin, who's a well-known filmmaker, uh, you know, was his friend and he sat with him while he killed himself. So this is what Tom tells us in the book is that he spends the weekend with Mark and finally Mark dies. And then Tom has to call Mark's family and tell them that he's dead. And then he has to call the police and the police come and take the body. And finally Tom is like exhausted and he, you know, hauls himself home. It's a Sunday. He buys the Sunday New York Times. He gets back into his apartment. He sits at the kitchen table. He opens the Times. And the cover story is by Andrew Sullivan and it's called When Plagues End. And it's a claim that AIDS is over because he and his elite friends could get the good drugs. And it's not about whiteness. I mean, Tom is white and Mark is white. And it's just the irony of this narcissism that kept people from extrapolating beyond their own immediate experience and creates this gap in public consciousness. So there are incredible correctives. So one of the great correctives was written by Linda Villarosa, who was a black lesbian reporter for the New York Times. And in 2000, she, was, she did it actually very early. She did a front page New York Times four part series on black women and HIV. That was absolutely groundbreaking. But recently in 2017, she did a cover story on black gay men in the US South, showing that they have a higher rate of HIV transmission than any country in the world. You know, and that's like amazing information, right? Because that's how racist the United States is and that's how much inequality we, and that's the consequence of not having a logical healthcare system. And it's interesting now with PrEP, because, you know, so if you're HIV positive and you have the standard of care treatment, you become virally suppressed. And that means that it's biologically impossible for you to infect anybody. You don't need to use a condom. You can't infect anyone because your virus is so low. So if everyone who was positive had the standard of care, everybody would be virally suppressed and you wouldn't need PrEP. But the huge market for PrEP is predicated on the fact that healthcare is unequal. And so you never know who out there is not virally suppressed. And it's, that's like, that's a mind fuck, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it sure is. Um, yeah, I'm reflecting on that. Um, so two of the questions that are coming up from the audience, one's anonymous and one's from um, Diremweed, is uh, about your relationship to, I guess, institutions. So one is, can you talk about your work and your relationship to academia? I'm thinking about the, a, queer, a queer historian's place in the university or queer history's place in the university. And then someone else asked, was it difficult to find a publisher for this book, given not its subject, not only just not just its subject matter, but as you mentioned, its size? Okay, so those are yeah. So my so in my generation, 
if you wanted to be out in your work, you couldn't have a career in academia. So my peers who are like in the forefront of queer academia, I mean, or Judith Butler's like three or four years older than me, but you know, generationally she's ahead of me, but we're the same age. So like, uh, you know, Ann Svekovich, Judith Halberstam, Jack Halberstam, all these people, their first books don't have any queer content. They had to do that to get tenure. If you wanted to be out, you couldn't be in academia. So that was, you know, that was a dividing thing. So that was not really an option. And I did, was a bad student anyway. So I eventually got my bachelor's, but it took a really long time. Um, and that's it. I don't, I went to graduate school for one day and that's another story. But anyway, so I got hired. I'm, a, I'm basically a novelist. That's my primary function. And I got hired to teach fiction writing in the City University of New York in 1999 when they still had a category called professional equivalence. So at that time I had published nine books. So they counted that as a PhD. So I got into the system. Today, I would not be hireable because you have to have a terminal degree. So no matter how much you've done in the world and no matter how much you've created, you cannot get even be considered. Like we can't even read someone's um, resume if they don't have a terminal degree. So, you know, it's a closed system now, but I got in before. So I teach at the, in the City University of New York, which has 23 campuses. And I teach at the second from the bottom in terms of graduation rates, the College of Staten Island. And I've been there for 22 years. So that's my role. So I don't have, I don't teach academics, I teach art. Um, the second question was publishing. So my history of publishing is very varied, like, First, I started out in like lesbian press then feminist press. Then I was in a mainstream press for 10 years. Then I had 10 years where I couldn't get any of my books published. I had four books that I could not get published because they were too far ahead. And that was like gentrification of the mind, ties that bind, familial homophobia and its consequences, a novel called The Child, which is one of my best novels, but it's about an intergenerational sexual relationship. And I wrote it the year that the priest scandal burst open and I couldn't get it published for 10 years um, and a novel called The Mere Future. And those four books, like they were sitting in my house. So for 10 years I disappeared, but I kept writing. Then they all came out at once and people thought I had had a manic episode or something, but no. And um, then my most recent nonfiction book, Conflict is Not Abuse, nobody in the United States would publish that book. And I mean, Nobody, not the feminist press, not Verso, not Duke, not no, not nobody, nobody. And I had to publish it in Canada uh, with a queer press in Vancouver, Canada called Arsenal Pulp Press. And I thought, okay, no one is going to see this book, nobody. But whatever, I needed to publish it. The reason I couldn't publish it in America was because it, I used. Uh, AIDS and Palestine as examples of a larger phenomena. And these are arenas that provoke so much anxiety among Americans that they can only be treated discreetly and they can't be shown as part of any other kind of large thought structure. So anyway, but the book, when it came out, I mean, at first when it came out, it was completely ignored. Like even Publishers Weekly, which reviews every book I've ever written, ignored that book. But when I started touring with it, because it was a Canadian book, so I had money from Canada Council, which in the US, small presses, you can't tour because there's no money. The audiences started to build. And suddenly I had like these big audiences of people who were in their 20s. And it was because of cancel culture, which I don't even mention in the book. And I wasn't even thinking of, and I barely knew what it was. But what I was talking about was resonating with this, youth culture phenomena and people were being attracted to the book. And by the time I finished my tour, I had 400 people in the room and the book took off like crazy. And so many people were, were talking about it from the grassroots up that Publishers Weekly ended up reviewing it five months after pub, which never happens because they had to. And then uh, to date, we've sold over 30,000 copies, um, right? You know, and it's just because people wanted to read it. I don't know, it, there was no, no apparatus from above. So then I came to this book and I had originally pitched it as a very small book. 
that was going to be called um, The Enduring Relationship of AIDS. It was going to be like a think book. But when I started really doing the research, I realized that was impossible. So they bought it for a very small amount of money. I'm not even going to tell you how small. Um, and it was going to be the small thing. And then I was like, hey, it's going to be bigger. <laughs> It's going to be 400 pages. Hey, it's going to be 600 pages. It's going to be 768 pages. And they were like, okay, great. And I had a really great editor, this young guy named Jackson Howard. And then they were like, you can have 60 photographs. So I emailed all these ACT UP people and I was like, do you have photographs that no one's ever seen? And they did. And um, I paid most of my advance for the photographic rights, but there are some incredible photographs in there, like the Latino Caucus, Maxine Wolf and her daughter, Amy, uh, Phyllis Sharp, Katrina Haslip on the day she got out of prison where she violated parole and came to a demonstration in Washington, DC. I mean, it's there, the photos are just incredible. So yeah, so that's, that's how it happened. And that's how I got to FSG and the book has done extremely well. Um, I think we've sold out the first printing, which is 13,000 copies. We have a 10,000 second printing, which is amazing for a huge book about AIDS. Um, and there will be a paperback at some point, but there's been a tiny lot, little tiny, tiny group of men who don't like it. So I'd say like 95% of the reviews have been very supportive and engaged. There's a small group of guys uh, who feel that Saying that other people did things to you takes away from the heroic stature of the people who've already been historicized. Most white people and most men don't think that, but there's a small group that do. And one of those, one of those two people was the reviewer for The Guardian, who was like, really was like, he doesn't understand what uh, oral history is. He said I didn't fact check. Um, because I relied on oral history. And there was a letter in The Guardian actually this week by two gay men accusing me of excluding gay men from my book, a book they've clearly never even looked at and have not read any reviews of. And it's like, just because you, I don't know, it's, I don't even, it's sad. It's very sad. It's pathetic actually. This idea that you lose something if, if the full story is revealed. It's just, um, it's just how fragile I think a certain generation of gay male identity is. And of course it's a very oppressed generation, not just from AIDS, but also from homophobia and familial homophobia. And people were told that they were nothing and their lives were worthless. So if they could be John Wayne, then their lives had value, but there is no John Wayne and nothing works that way. It's a lie. So. You know, I'm sorry, but uh, I wish that they would just read the book. Yeah, I, it's it's striking. And it's it's also really striking in the book itself when you talk about, you know, a lot of the gay men showing up for the reproductive rights marches or helping to protect women who are going to get abortions, um, that there was this really rich history of, of, of togetherness almost. For, yes, <laughs> I mean... The only non-AIDS issue that ACT UP took on was abortion rights and it was never even debated. There was never even a question about it. You know, from doing clinic defense to working with reproductive rights groups in responding to the Catholic church, it was, in, it was very organic. So this, I guess we're gonna have to conclude, which is devastating. Uh, Mad Madeline, do you have anything you wanted to add or final comments or? There's so much more here, and we, we got so many great questions as well. Um, I, I guess if we have time for one more question, um, Haley Bellamy asked in the chat um, and mentioned that they were working on lesbian activism in the UK and, um, and asked about sort of links between activism across, um, across nations. And I think that that's probably changed really fundamentally in the last 20 years now that now that you know there's sort of global internet um, and those connections can be made but I was so struck in this book by the way that you talk about how the different movements in within ACT UP kind of responded locally and then also had an umbrella of of ideas that that 
everybody came to. And I'm just curious what you think, how you think that's going to move forward in activism. Uh, before I answer that, I want to say something about lesbian activism in the UK. I had the fortune to be published by Sheba Press, which was basically a lesbian press. And it was run by two black women, Araba Mercer, who's passed away, but she's a sister of Kobina Mercer, and um, Michelle McKenzie, who's still around, and Sue O'Sullivan. And they published Audre Lorde in Britain, and they published me, and they were amazing. And they also were connected to a show on Channel 4 that was called Out on Tuesday. Um, that Sue and Cherry Smith, I think, were the producers, the co-producers. And it's an amazing show. I mean, it had episodes on lesbian life. Uh, there was an incredible episode on a, a lesbian bar raid in Peru that took place. Uh, it's really worth archivally going back and looking at that. Um, anyway, and then there was, yeah, you know, there were certain cities that were talking to each other and New York and London were in really in communication quite a bit at the time. Um, so there was, a, there was a deep relationship then. And then the, the final, what was the other part about oh, the future? Well, I think that one thing that's really interesting now, and I know nothing about what's going on in the UK, but uh, in America is that our most radical grassroots movements right now, the movement against police violence, the movement for black lives, the movement for immigration reform, Palestine solidarity, all of these movements have queer and trans people in leadership. And that is very different than the past. And that means that the most radical parts of queer liberation are living in these other movements and that's where they belong. Uh, and, you know, and that's very exciting. And that's, that's, that is the future. Perfect that place. Be a really feeling place to stop there. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. Go ahead. No, Madeline, you said exactly what I did. Do you want to close this out? I just want to say thank you so much um, to Sarah, to you, Sam, for for this conversation, and to Torch for hosting us, and for all of the really great questions um, that we got, and uh, and for everyone for showing up. Thank you, everybody. Thank yes, you so thank much. you to the attendees. Week eight, really appreciate it. <laughs> Nearly there. <laughs> <laughs>